Okay, I think we can go ahead and get started. Thank you all for coming to this uh, seminar hosted by DGRAV. Uh, today, we're going to hear about pulsar timing arrays from two experts in the field, uh, Stephen Taylor and Nihan Pohl. Uh, Steve Taylor is a, as an assistant professor at Vanderbilt University and the current chair of the Nanograv Collaboration. And Nihan Pohl is a postdoctoral researcher at Vanderbilt University. Um, so first we're going to hear from Steve, a uh, more general talk, and then we're gonna hear a more um, a research specific talk on uh, from Nihan. Um, as a reminder, the format of this is that we're going to have the two talks and then we'll have uh, questions about both talks at the end. So please hold your questions until the end. Um, so Steve, do you wanna get started? Yeah, thanks so much, Sarah. Um, hopefully people can hear me and uh, also see the right screen. Does that look good? Yes. Looks great. All right, thank you. Well, thanks so much for the invitation. And um, there are lots of uh, Pulsar Time and Array experts on this call, including Sarah. And I see Scott Ransom, uh, the previous chair of Nanograv is on as well. If I've missed anyone, I'm sorry. I can't, I can't see the participants anymore. Uh, but I'll just give you a, a, an overview of uh, pulsar timing arrays and uh, the kind of science that we do, where we are at the moment, and uh, the problems we're tackling. Uh, Nihan will give a more detailed overview of uh, upcoming prospects. So first of all, um, as we usually do, we, we place ourselves in the gravitational wave landscape. And um, we're right down at nanohertz frequencies um, in the regime of, of uh, say a few nanohertz to 100 nanohertz, and um, that's that's really a product of of us timing uh, our pulsars, and I'll explain this more soon. Our timing our pulsars over uh, years to decades, and so just from how we've sampled our our pulsar observations, that gets us down to a few nanohertz when we're at uh, decade length observations, and then going back to uh, the pulsars every few weeks allows us to sample up to a few a few hundred nanohertz in, in fluctuations. Um, so we're we're very much below the terrestrial detectors um, and including uh, LISA, which would be at millihertz frequencies, we're right down here um, at, at nanohertz frequencies. And I'll talk about this more later, but our primary target population are merging supermassive black hole binaries. And in fact, we will not see the merger of these black hole binaries, we'll see the, the in-spiral stage, um, and we'll see not just one or two, but every single one of them um, in the nearby universe, all forming a confusion gravitational wave background. But first of all, um, what, what makes us very unique as a detector is that we use an astrophysical object as a crucial part of our detector apparatus. We're using uh, pulsars as essentially clocks sprinkled throughout the galaxy. Um, we can time these, these pulsars to exquisite precision. And if there are any deviations to those uh, pulse times of arrival that we measure, um, then we could ascribe that to gravitational waves. Now, of course, we, we can ascribe that to many noise sources as well. And so as I'll talk about soon, we don't just time one pulsar and call it a day, we time a, an array of pulsars throughout the galaxy. So here's a, a very rough cartoon, and it's not scientifically accurate. It's just giving you an idea, an idea of what a gravitational wave propagating through our galaxy might do to our uh, radio pulse times of arrival. Um, as it propagates and interacts with the Earth pulsar line of sight, it's causing a change in the proper separation between the Earth and the pulsar. And that causes pulses to arrive earlier or later than expected based on our curated timing models. Um, which we've developed over many years. And these time and model behaviors of the pulsars are, uh, are deterministic descriptions of the rotational properties and other properties of a pulsar. For example, how fast it's spinning, how much that, that spin is changing over time, where it is on the sky, and also includes things like um, any interaction of the pulses with the ionized interstellar medium. So it's not just the, the physics and the noise of the pulsar we have to take into account, but everything that's happening in between. However, not even our best times pulsar could uniquely tell us that, that we found gravitational waves. There's always some unknown process 
uh, happening in neutron stars or along this Earth pulsar line of sight that could mimic and appear at least spectrally like gravitational waves. So we don't just use one pulsar, we use an array. And this is a, a nice cartoon that shows three pulsars with different colors uh, embedded in a background of gravitational waves from many different sources across the sky. And in this bottom uh, panel here, you're seeing the, the time evolving gravitational wave stream. And it's not a nice, neat waveform like people may be used to in, in, for single events in, in LIGO or even looking at strain patterns for LISA events. Um, this is a stochastic signal. It's built up from many events across the sky. Um, however, even though it looks random and it is individually a random process, it's statistically correlated among the different pulsars. And what's great is if you follow, follow the math and, and, and work out what that correlation is between pulsars, for an isotropic gravitational wave background, it's only a function of the angular separation between our pulsars on the sky. So we're using an array of pulsars and the kind of pattern we're looking for in order to pull out the significance of this gravitational wave background is called the Hellings and Downs curve. Um, this, is, this is kind of our smoking gun signature for a gravitational wave background. It's a statistical correlation signature. It tells us the expected pattern of time of arrival deviations when correlated between pulsars uh, at different angular separations on the sky. Um, broadly speaking, some of the important features here are, 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 are on, the, on the plot here. It's mostly quadrupolar. However, the antenna response pattern for pulsar timing arrays has a preferred direction. And that, that's just saying that the, the, the uh, gravitational waves are um, uh, coming from directions close to the pulsar um, are more preferred. So we have more sensitivity to gravitational wave lines of sight close to the pulsar positions. And so that breaks some of the symmetry and leads to the Hellings and Downs curve coming back up to half its value once we get to angular separations of 180 degrees. Um, so detection or, or significance of the gravitational wave background in PTAs requires us to extract significance of this curve, this Hellings and Downs curve. And to do that, we need to have many pulsars um, sprinkled across angular separation space uh, in order to fill out this correlation curve. Um, so it's not just finding a cluster of pulsars close together on the sky, that will certainly give us high signal to noise, but it wouldn't be able to trace out this pattern and, uh, and this pattern really is quite unique. We can't, we can't devise anything else that would produce this quadrupolar-like pattern. So many pulsars are needed for this endeavor. Um, going back to sources, what we might expect for sources of these frequencies, um, the primary population we're targeting are uh, supermassive black hole binaries, which should be ubiquitous as a consequence of galaxy mergers over cosmic time, um, where massive black, massive black holes reside in the centers of mass, massive galaxies. And as galaxies grow via mergers, um, those, those black holes in the centers eventually find each other and form binary systems um, that will emit gravitational waves in the PTA band. So in the same way that this kind of pattern and I'm sure everyone here is familiar with, with what this is. This is GW150914 um, in, in Livingston and, and Hanford uh, overlaid on top of each other. In the same way that this waveform pattern is signaling this physics, for us in PTAs, this Hellings and Downs curve is signaling an, a stochastic gravitational wave background, um, likely from a population of in spiraling supermassive black hole binary systems. Um, which should be out there in the universe at our frequencies. Well, here are we and what, uh, what are we doing uh, together? Um, I work mostly within Nanograv and I'm the current chair of Nanograv, which is the North American Nanohertz Observatory for Gravitational Waves. Uh, we use um, the Green Bank Telescope in West Virginia. Um, we also use CHIME and VLA observations as well. Uh, IROC bar observations have formed a huge uh, anchor in our data set. Unfortunately, obviously, we can't uh, use it anymore, but it's a crucial part of our data sets uh, and will be into the future as well as a consequence of the long timescale signals we're looking for. Uh, we also have European partners. Um, this is a, a smattering of the video telescopes that they have access to in the European Pulsar Timing Array. 
Uh, there's also the Parks Pulsar Timing Array, which uses one telescope, the Parks Radio Telescope. Um, and we've been joined in the International Pulsar Timing Array by the Indian PTA, which uses GMRT. Um, we also have some other more um, telescope-centered um, missions like NIRCAT. Part of NIRCAT is the Near Time mission to do uh, pulsar timing observations. And there's also the Chinese Pulsar Timing Array, which uses uh, FAST and other radio telescopes as well. So all together, we, uh, we operate as the International Pulsar Timing Array. And we're on parallel tracks, but every now and again, we come together, combine our data sets, and try to strengthen our inference on gravitational waves. Now, a brief aside on terminology um, that, I, that I want to point out. Um, when we talk about putting constraints on the gravitational wave background, we're usually referencing the amplitude of, um, of a background formed from compact objects all in spiraling together. And that gives a characteristic strain that has this behavior, goes this frequency to the minus two thirds. Uh, but we don't directly observe strain. We observe perturbations to our timing observations. And so the power spectral density in timing space actually goes as frequency to the minus 13 thirds. So that's four and a third. Um, and so that's the behavior that I'll reference. If you, if you see gamma or another kind of spectral exponent in following, you'll see um, that I've indicated um, a reference point for 13 thirds. This is the history of limits on pulsar time and array measurements. Uh, going back to the first discovery of the millisecond pulsar. Over time, our limits have steadily improved until in about the mid 2010s, we started to really cut into interest in astrophysical territory for uh, predictions of binary supermassive black hole backgrounds. But then these limits um, started saturating in, in about 2015 onwards. And then what happens is we've, we've made a a detection of something. So that detection is, uh, as I'll mention uh, quite soon on the next slide, it's not yet the gravitational wave background. It's some sort of common spectrum process among our pulsars. That is, it has similar statistical properties in, uh, in many of our pulsars. And Nanograv found this in, in 2020, uh, followed by the Parkes Pulsar Timing Array, the European Pulsar Timing Array, and then uh, we all combined some older, somewhat obsolete data sets to form uh, an international pulsar timing array data set, and that found it too. So what this thing is, we refer to it as a common spectrum process. On the left is just a, a Bayesian uh, representation of a power spectrum in our timing residuals, our timing deviations. That's what the gray violins are. And if we, um, if we allow the data to decide um, how many frequencies in this common spectrum process are fit to a power law, we get, um, we get the um, blue region, the, the blue line here, which is a power law that flattens out. It looks like at higher frequencies, we're still coupled to excess noise, but the data is deciding that we should fit to a power law best in the lowest five frequencies. And if we look at the, um, the amplitude and the spectral index behavior of that power law, that gets shown as the, the blue or the orange regions on the right-hand side. So the right-hand side is showing our posterior probability distribution for the amplitude and spectral index of this common spectrum process in 45 pulsars, where the maximum baseline of coverage in our array is about 12.9 years. And the reference point here, as I, as I mentioned before, is four and a third, which is the expectation for uh, a binary supermassive black hole population. So we're consistent with that. And what's more, the amplitude is uh, consistent with population models of supermassive black hole binaries. This is showing that um, all of the other PTAs found this as well. And the combination in the International Pulsar Timing Array uh, also found this. Everyone's results are overlapping. So this builds confidence that, uh, that what we're seeing is, is tantalizing. So what is this common spectrum process? Um, is it the background? Do we have those, those Hellings and Downs correlations? Um, at the moment, the signal to noise ratio values and Bayesian odds ratios are inconclusive. Um, what about spectral consistency with supermassive black hole binaries? That we do have that, um, but the amplitude is appearing towards the high end of astrophysical models. However, that's still fine. There's no real tension there. Um, lastly, could this just be a conspiracy of similar intrinsic pulsar red noise or systematics? 
um, we'll, we'll need informative cross correlations to check, but there's no real plausible model that we can think of that would produce um, pulsar red noise or other kinds of systematic behaviors um, with these kinds of spectral properties. What about those cross correlations between the pulsars? These are um, the most up-to-date reconstructions of cross correlations between pulsars by the three main uh, long time scale PTAs. Um, you would have to squint to try to see any type of Hellings and Downs behavior here. Um, and indeed, the, the interpulsar correlations are currently insignificant, which is not saying they're disfavored, just that we, um, we don't have the significance. And the Bayesian odds ratios for Hellings and Downs pattern uh, at the moment is uh, less than five to one in favor. So to jump ahead, what might be the road ahead? For, for binaries at least. Um, we think within the next couple of years, um, we'll have uh, a detection of a gravitational wave background. That will come packaged with some really interesting spectral characterization of that background, um, which will tell us a lot about the binary population. Um, after that, we'll slowly start to be able to resolve individual binaries out of that stochastic background and out of that population. After we get individual binaries, we hope that there are good prospects for multi-messenger binaries. That is, um, you know, we have lots of candidate supermassive black hole binary systems in large optical time domain surveys uh, seen as periodically variable um, quasars. And um, when the Vera Rubin Observatory switches on and starts operating, we may have many more as well. Um, so we could be sensitive to the same types of, of, of binaries that will be observable um, in EM observations of periodic quasars. And so we're hopeful that we can see some multi-messenger binaries. And once we have the background and individual systems that may be seen in multi-messenger ways, we can start extracting more and more information about that binary population. So once we do start to characterize the spectrum of gravitational waves, um, we'll get interest in information of, um, of not just the power law that we, that we initially expect, but also any interest in shapes and deviations from that power law that could signal uh, astrophysics um, happening at wider orbital separations down at lower frequencies. So actually at lower frequencies here, corresponding to wider orbital separations, the black hole binaries may be uh, still coupled to their ambient astrophysical environment um, and could encode signatures here of stellar interactions, uh, interactions with the circumbinary disk or even residual binary eccentricity when the systems are entering the band. So there's lots of interest in uh, dynamical information at the lower frequencies. And in the overall amplitude, amplitude, there's interest in demographic information, things like weight factors and overall merger time scales for supermassive black hole binaries. If you're interested in more of this information, then you can check out um, a recent paper that we had, um, that should say, <laughs> that should say 2021, um, not 2010. This is, um, this is Astrophysics Milestones for Pulsar Time and Array Gravitational Wave Detection, which was led by Nihan, and I'm sure he'll talk about it uh, in more detail soon. Um, now, before here, I had a cloud after spectral characterization um, before individual binaries, and that's conveying that we may actually start to resolve individual sources, firstly, as just excess directional power through anisotropy searches. Um, the anisotropy will probe here will not be like the CMB. We're not looking for fundamental physics. This is more a tracer of the binary population uh, in the nearby universe, and that may show up as excess directional power. And we can track that through measuring correlations between pulsars and the different patterns that the anisotropy will create there. This is kind of a realistic level of anisotropy from a binary population where you might be looking at anisotropy levels of a few percent. But once we do start to be able to be sensitive to individual systems, we can extract parameters of those systems. And these are just showing some of our recent limits on individual supermassive black hole binaries in Nanograph that uh, was led by Caitlin Witt. And this is from our 12 and a half year data set. Um, this plot on the left here is showing the base factor for the presence of a continuous wave signal. We call them continuous wave signals because for us, the, the gravitational wave signals are essentially non-evolving. And it's also showing the importance of taking into account this common spectrum process as well. Otherwise we get biased inference of, of base factors for continuous wave sources. Um, but the evolution in our upper limits on continuous wave signals across different frequencies 
is consistent with expectations based on our improving sensitivity. And that's shown as evolving upper limit curves on the right hand side here, up to the 12 and a half year. If you're interested in, in looking at individual sources and, and candidates, this is showing a sky map of um, the, the Bayesian constraints we can put of sources within certain uh, horizon distances. And so this is essentially saying that there are no sources within distances given by this color bar. So we've, we've put Bayesian uh, limits on these sources. Um, so in the most sensitive part of the sky where we have the most pulsars, we can put limits out to uh, roughly 80 or 90 meg uh, megaparsecs for 10 to the nine solar mass systems. Uh, in, our, in our least sensitive part of the sky, away from the pulsar population, uh, that reduces down to about 20 to 30 megaparsecs. Now I'll skip along here because uh, I, should, um, I should hand over to Nihan, but as I said, we're interested in multi-messenger counterparts as well. And this may be expected in the kind of gaseous environments that, uh, that follow galaxy mergers that bring these supermassive black holes together. Um, we could get interest in gas structures surrounding the binary supermassive black holes that could lead to periodic electromagnetic signatures. Um, and we can track that along with the gravitational wave signal and, and actually extract some interesting, um, interesting joint constraints on these systems. There are two main ways that we could um, measure a multi-messenger supermassive black hole binary. And that would be initially through gravitational waves where we get a broad sky localization um, followed by trying to identify host galaxy and doing some sort of photometric follow-up. That's the conventional way that, that, um, that LIGO is pursuing for binary black holes. Um, but for us as well, we could, we could track down the existing binary candidates we have from large optical time domain survey, do targeted PTA validation of those candidates, and um, if we're fortunate, actually measure uh, gravitational waves and, and confirm that as a multi-messenger system. And we've done that so far on some prime candidates and being able to put in, uh, in improved limits on the masses of those kinds of systems. So I've focused on binaries here, but there are many other sources that we could access in the, in the gravitational wave zoo for PTAs. Um, those include being able to constrain alternative polarizations of gravitational waves, some types of dark matter candidates, cosmic strings, uh, early universe physics, including primordial gravitational waves or gravitational waves resulting from phase transitions. Um, so there, there are lots of other signals we're probing here and they have um, distinct spectral properties from what we might expect from the supermassive black hole binaries. So to finish off my, um, my overview, PTAs could be seeing the first sign of a background of gravitational waves. Um, we'll need more data to, to show that, um, more data than just our 12 and a half year data set. And the great news is that we've got a, a new data set that um, has, has almost 16 years of data now and uh, uh, more than 20 new pulsars have been added. Um, so after, after measuring um, evidence for gravitational wave background, we expect that we'll get information about the spectrum, which will tell us about the astrophysical properties of the population and start to perform probes of anisotropy, modified gravity and hunting for uh, interest in early universe signals. And beyond just the background, we're interested in resolving individual supermassive black hole binary systems and if we're fortunate, finding multi-messenger uh, properties of those. So I'll end here and uh, thanks so much for your attention and uh, happy to pass it over to you. Thanks, Steve. Nihan, go ahead. Thanks, Steve. Thanks, Sarah. Okay, I'm assuming you can see my presentation. Yes, we can. Okay, excellent. Um, yeah, so thanks for inviting me again. Um, and um, I'm going to pick up where Steve left off. And we're going to take a little bit of a step back and um, focus in this second part of the talk, mainly on the gravitational wave background, which you'll see um, uh, represented on all of these slides as GWB. Um, so what we're going to do is we're going to spend this part of the talk, um, for the most part, between the first two milestones on Steve's roadmap, where we will talk about prospects for detecting the stochastic gravitational wave background in the next few years. Um, and then we'll also talk a little bit about 
um, prospects of detecting multiple background signals. So back, maybe we, we live in a very lucky realization of the universe where we have a background that's detectable from the supermassive black hole binary population. But maybe we also have a background that's detectable from, say, primordial gravitation waves. So we look at um, how our current methods are set up to detecting multiple backgrounds in our data sets. And then finally, we take a step further beyond that second milestone and look at how we can search for the anisotropy and how that might serve as a bridge um, towards detecting individual systems and the methods that we've developed to perform searches for anisotropy in our data sets. So first off, let's begin by talking about um, detection prospects for a single stochastic gravitational wave background. So to try and quantify um, the detection prospects in the next several years for the background, um, what we did was we started out with the 45 pulsars that were present in the nanograph 12 and a half year data set. Um, and we used the noise and cadence that we, met, that we had for these pulsars in that data set. And we simulated uh, um, all of those 45 pulsars um, using those noise and cadence that we measured in the real data set. So once we had these simulated 45 pulsars, we then we then drew the um, we then simulated cadence from the last year of observation for these pulsars and extended the baseline for these simulated pulsars out to a total baseline of 20 years. So, like Steve said, the 12 and a half year data set had a baseline of approximately 13 years. So we go out about seven years into the future um, with the simulated data set. And so once we have the simulated data set with us, what we did is that we injected different types of gravitation wave background signals. Um, and we looked at how um, our, our pipeline responds to this and when we would detect these different kinds of gravitation wave signals. And so this style of simulating data um, will sort of be at the core of these three different um, topics that we talk about. Um, so detecting single backgrounds, detecting multiple backgrounds, and also a little bit in um, characterizing an isotropy. So for this part in particular, we um, injected four different types of um, gravitation wave background signals shown in this plot of the right-hand side, where we injected a simple pure power law. And we also injected three more realistic spectra that would, that would be expected to come out of a um, supermassive black hole binary population generated gravitation wave background. Um, so among these realistic spectra, one, uh, looks almost exactly like a pure power law at low frequencies, whereas the other two have some sort of turnover at low frequencies, which, like Steve said, can occur because of because of interaction of the binary with its um, environment. And so we looked at how the presence of this turnover in the spectrum could potentially affect uh, detection prospects for these kinds of gravitation wave signals. So before we get to the milestones that we defined in this analysis, um, we needed a statistic to quantify these PDA milestones. So the evidence for Hellings and Downs correlations that Steve mentioned in his talk, um, that's a good statistic to use, but unfortunately what it does is that it's only looking at the information that's present in the cross correlations between different pulsars in the atom. Whereas we, we, are, we do have information present in the, the signal from just a single pulsar as well, which we call the autocorrelations. So in, in defining this total signal to noise ratio, what we did is that we, we made sure that we are capturing information from both the autocorrelations and the cross correlations to define the statistics so that we're capturing the full strength of the signal in our model. So this total signal to noise is essentially a log likelihood ratio between a model with the full gravitation wave background plus noise versus a model that contains only noise. And so here's how it um, compares with the Hellings and Down signal to noise shown here on the x-axis and the total signal to noise shown by the straw hat on the y-axis. And you can see that they are related because the Hellings and Down signal to noise captures a part of the total signal to noise, which is the information in the cross correlations. Right, so the very first question which Steve kind of left us on a cliffhanger with is when can we expect to make a, a robust detection of the gravitation wave back, or put it another way, when can we expect to collect enough evidence to be able to say that the signal that we've seen um, is more likely to be astrophysical? And so to try to answer that question, what we did is we calculated the template signal to noise ratios shown in this panel on the top um, across a bunch of different timing baselines for three different types of correlations that we typically look for in our um, gravitation wave background analyses. 
So the Hellings and Downs curve is the, the smoking and signature of a astrophysical gravitation wave background and is shown here in this red shaded region. Um, the other two types of correlations, so the monopole and the dipole, are usually um, representative of systematic errors in our modeling of either the um, global time scale or the global time scale um, relative to the GPS, whereas the dipole um, correlations represent an error in modeling of the barycenter of the solar system. So what we're looking for here is how does this Hellings and down signal to noise um, grow as a function of the time and baseline. And so in black here is, is the um, signal to noise that we derived from the nanograph 12 and a half year data set, which sits at around two or so. And so what we found is that anywhere between baselines of 15 and 18, nanograph should have, based on these simulations, and if the signal in the 12 and a half year data set was really an astrophysical signal, and we were just seeing the first hints of that signal in the 12 and a half year data set, then anywhere between 15 to 18 years of data, we should have sufficient evidence to say that the signal that we are seeing is um, indeed astrophysical. And the three panels on the bottom gave a, a representation of how the variation in the Hellings and Downs curve might look like at different levels of the Hellings and Downs signal to noise um, value. So on the left-hand side is, the, is how the curve would look like um, at the initial detection. In the middle, it's at a more intermediate level detection. And on the right-hand side is a very strong detection of the Hellings and Downs correlation. And these uncertainties here are the realization variance. So it's not the measurement variance per se. Um, so you could have Hellings and Downs, you could have measured cross-correlation uncertainties lying anywhere along these uncertainty, along these uncertainties. So once we have a once we have sufficient evidence to claim that the signal is indeed astrophysical, the next question that we would ask is then what is the source of the gravitation wave background? And so typically most of our modeling involves trying to characterize the gravitation wave background using a power law spectral template. And so what we did in this analysis is we looked at how the fractional fractional uncertainty on the amplitude shown here on the left and the uncertainty on the spectral index shown here on the right would evolve as a function of the total signal to noise. And so what we found is that at the initial detection, we expect to have a fractional uncertainty of about 44% on the amplitude and about 40% on the spectral index for the um, gravitation wave background that we would detect. And this level of precision is, is sufficient to distinguish between a supermassive black hole binary origin for the gravitation wave background versus a few other um, sources of, of the gravitation wave background, like a few models of cosmic strings or a few models of um, primordial gravitation waves. So once we have the source of the gravitation wave background, um, we can then probe deeper and try to extract the information from the spectrum itself. And this is where the three different types of spectra that we injected um, come into focus. Because once, let's, for instance, assume that we found that this background seems consistent with a supermassive black hole binary as its origin, then we want to dig deeper and try to extract as much physics out of the signal that we found as possible. And as Steve mentioned, mentioned in this talk, the spectrum of the background will contain information about the interactions of these binary systems with their environment. So um, there's two things that we looked at with respect to different types of um, gravitation wave background spectra. And on the left-hand side, I'm showing on the y-axis the total signal to noise again. And on the x-axis, we have the timing baseline. And the different colored um, lines represent the total signal to noise values that we recovered for the different types of injected spectra. And so um, the injected spectra, if you don't remember what they look like, they're also shown in this plot on the right-hand side. But um, what what we see is that even for the, the spectra that we injected, which has the most aggressive turnover at low frequencies, so this positive spectra shown here in this blue, even for that spectrum, between the baselines of 15 and about 18 years or so, um, it does not really significantly affect our um, recovered total signal to noise ratio. So even if there is this kind of um, turnover present at low frequencies in the gravitational wave background, we don't think it'll it'll inhibit our first um, detection of a gravitational wave background. Um, this the the 
the decay in the total signal to noise um, really becomes evident once you hit a baseline of about 20 years. But really before that, it does not seem to make too much of a difference. So presence of turnovers or, or complexities coming from um, real, real gravitational background spectra should not inhibit us from making, um, at least um, collecting enough evidence to show that we have an astrophysical background signal. And so on the plot on the right-hand side, um, we also looked at when we would actually be able to see that the spectrum that we recover for the gravitation wave background is different from a pure power loss spectrum. Um, and so what we found is that, unfortunately, we would have to wait about three or four years past the initial detection to start making statements about um, the presence of any kind of turnover in the gravitation wave background spectrum. And a lot of this also depends on the, the real spectrum itself. If it does have an even more aggressive turnover in it at lower frequencies, then we'll obviously detect it sooner than, than what we were able to say based on these simulations. All right, so moving on. Um, what I wanted to spend the next few minutes talking about is um, talking about detection prospects for not just a single stochastic background in our data set, but also looking for multiple stochastic gravitation wave backgrounds. So to do this analysis, we again use the same set of um, the same underlying set of simulations to produce our um, pulsar timing array data set. But rather than injecting just a single power loss signal, in this case, we injected two power loss signals. And there's a lot going on in this plot, but I mainly want you to focus on three things, which is the other spectrum, so the spectrum outside of the supermassive black hole binary spectrum, given by that 13 third spectral index. Mm -hmm. um, so the other spectrum that we injected was a slightly steeper gravitation wave background spectrum, which is predicted to come from one of the models for primordial gravitational waves. Um, and that's shown by this um, solid red line. Um, so what we did for these analyses is that we injected both of these power loss signals into these simulated timing array data sets that we constructed. And again, we went out to a baseline of 20 years and tried to answer the question of when we would start to see the presence of the second signal in our data set using our current methods. And the final thing to keep in mind is that we always have to worry about this white noise float, which um, essentially degrades our sensitivity to these backgrounds at high frequencies. And so we only really have a limited set of frequencies that we are really sensitive to where the background actually rises above this white noise flow. So these are the three main components that, that we typically have to think about when we're trying to model these uh, effects. All right, so um, first off, we can try and look at when we might be able to actually detect, uh, detect this second gravitation wave background that might be present in addition to the 13 third supermassive black hole binary background. And so that's shown in this plot on the left-hand side. Um, and this is work done by Andrew Kaiser, who's a grad student at WVU. Um, so on the y-axis, we have the injected amplitude for the second gravitation wave background, so the primordial gravitation wave background. On the x-axis, we have the timing baseline. And the color scale here represents the median base factor across the 100 realizations that we did in this analysis. And so what we find from this plot is that we would really need to have a, a primordial background that's that's quite loud in order to in order to be able to detect it um, starting at baselines from about 18 years or so. So about three or four years into the future from our latest data set. However, what we also saw is that this detection significance, so the, the numbers shown on this plot on the left-hand side are really the medians across these realizations, but there are a few realizations where we are able to make a really strong detection of the second background with base factors greater than about a um, thousand or so. And so the, the significance of of whether we will be able to detect the second, pro second process is really realization dependent. And it just becomes a matter of whether we live in a fun enough universe that we would have more than one um, gravitation wave background. Um, on, the, on the plot on the right-hand side, I'm showing how the constraints on the measurement of the spectral index of the second background evolve again as a function of time and the injected primordial gravitation wave um, background amplitude. Um, so here again, we can see that around about um, a timing baseline of 18 years or so, we start to get fractional uncertainties on the spectral index that are good enough that we can start making statements about the presence of a second background signal in our data set relative 
uh, over or over um, the first 13 thirds background that, that we might have detected before that. So the other thing that was really um, interesting about this analysis is that we wanted to look at how the presence of two signals would affect the detection of the first supermassive black hole background binary signal. Um, and then eventually, when we do detect the second process, um, how do the two processes play with each other given our current detection pipeline? And so that's what's shown in, in this set of plots, where the two panels on the top show the um, amplitude that's recovered for the supermassive black hole binary signal. And the bottom two plots show the um, amplitude on the bottom and the spectral index in the middle plot for the second process, so the primordial gravitational wave background signal that we injected into our data sets. So starting with the two plots at the bottom, um, this um, horizontal purple line shows the injected values. And as we saw in the previous plot, um, at about a baseline of 18 years or so, we start to see the second process emerge in our data set, where we can see the 68 and 90, 95% um, credible regions um, around it begin to close in on the values that we've injected. But what's also really interesting to look at is how the presence of this second background affects this first background that presumably we'll detect before um, the second process. So what we see is that this horizontal red dash, dash dotted line shows the injected supermassive black hole background amplitude in these simulated data sets. And we see that initially before we've started to see hints of the second process around about here, we tend to consistently overestimate the amplitude for the supermassive black hole binary background. Again, this might not be too surprising given that there's two backgrounds, but we're modeling a single one. And that's more explicitly seen by this orange shaded region in the second panel, where we are searching for just a single fixed 13 third spectrum in our data. And once we start to detect the second process at the 18 year baseline, we see that the, the discrepancy starts to soften. And then we end up towards the 20 year baseline, um, picking back up the correct injected amplitude for the supermassive black hole binary background. And so this is something to keep in mind where if, if there indeed is a second background signal, we might expect it to um, interfere with the parameter estimation of the first background signal. But all is, all is not lost because we do expect to make a detection of the second signal um, eventually, even if it comes a little bit down the, down the road from the um, detection of the first signal. So, so one, one valid point that you might bring up is that this is only happening because we are limited by just these power law models for um, modeling these two backgrounds. So to sort of work around that, we also looked at the um, full spectrum that we recovered for the processes in our data. And unfortunately, we did not see any, any hints of any spectral features in our recovery of the spectrum of the process in our data that would tell us that there's um, two processes that exist in the data just offhand. Um, so that's shown in this plot where these two black lines are showing the two different processes that we injected in this particular realization. And we and the recovered free spectrum or the recovered spectrum is shown by these blue points. And we can see that there's really no hint of, of the presence of um, more than a single background there. So this doesn't really help us get around the, the limitations of power law modeling, at least not for the simulations that we did. Um, and with the um, parameters that we injected. But one quick thing that I do want to note is that typically in, in pulsar timing array literature, we, we tend to um, use this, this 13 third spectral index as, as sort of our default um, reference point. Um, and as, as part of this analysis, what we did is we also checked whether we would be able to um, tell whether there's a different process that does not have a 13 thirds, 13 thirds spectral index uh, associated with it. And so what we did was we did a simple model selection run um, across all of these 100 realizations where the power law for one of the processes was fixed at 13 thirds, whereas we had injected only a um, gamma equals five primordial gravitational wave background. And so what we found is that as we accumulate a longer baseline in our data set, we see that the base factor shown here on the y-axis the, the base factor for the presence of this other non 13 thirds process indeed keeps growing quite significantly as we add more data to our pulsar timing array. 
So this this also safeguards us against um, the fact that um, we are still sensitive to non 13 thirds processes in our data sets, even though we choose to use that as sort of our um, default for um, the numbers that we report. And then in the last few minutes, um, I want to talk really briefly about um, constraining anisotropy in the gravitation wave background. So Steve already gave a, a very nice overview of why anisotropy is interesting. And um, it, it, in particular, it's interesting because it could, it could serve as, as an intermediate step towards our detection of individual supermassive black hole binaries using the gravitation wave emission. So to the, the biggest roadblock to doing um, anisotropy searches within the pulsar timing array um, pipelines is that it just takes too long because we have to, the model is really complicated. We have too many parameters, more than 100 parameters in the Bayesian runs. And so it becomes really difficult and challenging to do these um, runs using a standard Bayesian pipeline. So to, to work around these, these roadblocks, um, I led the development of a new set of techniques to search for an isotropy, um, all of which center around this equation shown on this slide. But on the left-hand side, you have your, your overlap reduction function, which is essentially your, your correlation template. Um, so think of Hellings and Downs, um, that would be your overlap reduction function. And so we get this um, out from our current detection pipelines. Um, it's one of the things that we produce. Um, and so these methods are, are designed to tack on right at the end of our current Bayesian pipelines. So this overlap reduction function is equal to the this matrix F, which is essentially the product of anterior response functions for the pairs of pulsars in your PDA. And you know this matrix once the PTS sky configuration has been fixed. So essentially, once you have your pulsar timing array, you know what this F matrix is. And so all that's left to do is model or search for the power on the sky. So if you had a perfectly isotropic background, the, this matrix would just be once um, all in it. And you would end up with a Hellings and Downs um, code. And so the software to do all of these searches is available on GitHub at this package. So the final missing piece is choosing a basis with which you want to represent your um, gravitation wave background power. And typically, the most popular um, um, bases that people use are either the pixel basis, which is optimized for pixel scale features, so things like individual supermassive black hole binaries or the spherical harmonic basis, which is optimized for larger extended features. So think of things like clusters or large over densities of inspiring supermassive black hole binaries in, in one particular part of the sky. So the, the drawback with using the spherical harmonic basis as is, is that it, it does not condition the power to be positive across all sky. So as a result of this, what we did was we um, mo used a slightly modified basis where rather than modeling the power itself, you model the square root of the power. And by modeling the square root of the power, you by default force the power to be positive um, all across the sky. And you can then decompose the square root power onto a spherical harmonic basis. And so the idea behind um, calculating your coefficients is essentially the same, but you get this inbuilt regularization um, essentially for free when you do um, your calculations in this slightly modified basis. And so to put this in, we actually combined parts of the LISA-oriented blip software package developed by Banagiri et al. Um, into the MAP software package that we've um, developed for this one. So this is a nice combination of LISA and Pulsar Timing Array software to, to search for a nice sort of view. So here's a quick example. On the left-hand side, um, the, the color scale shows the injected anisotropy and the contours show the uh, recovered anisotropy. And we can see that we, we do a good job of recovering what was injected in this um, simulated toy example. And on the right hand side is the angular power spectrum. And here again, we can see that we do a really good job of recovering what was injected in, into this um, toy example. All right, so um, since this is going to be deployed on real data, we also need to define a, a few detection statistics in order to um, make the claim that we have found deviations away from the Hellings and Downs curve, which we are interpreting as an isotropy. So the first detection statistic is this, um, what we call decision threshold or um, CL threshold. Um, and it's simply defined as the value of angular power that would correspond to a P value of 0 0.005 under your null hypothesis. And remember that the null hypothesis when you're searching for an isotropy is going to be isotropy. So your Hellings and Downs curve 
is going to be a null hypothesis when doing all of these searches. And so this plot on the right-hand side shows how this decision threshold evolves as a function of both the number of pulsars in your pulsar timing array and the uncertainties on your cross correlations. And this is pretty much as you would expect, where when you have more pulsars, you have more cross correlation data points, um, which allows you to place um, stricter constraints on your decision threshold. Whereas on the other hand, if your uncertainties are smaller, then you again um, move towards the right on this x-axis, meaning you are able to probe um, smaller levels of anisotropy with your data set. The other detection statistic is the signal to noise, um, which is defined as the ratio of maximum likelihood values. And here we can define three different types of signal to noise statistics. The total signal to noise, which is the likelihood ratio between a fully anisotropic model versus a model with just noise, the isotropic signal to noise, which is an isotropic model um, versus a model with just noise, and the anisotropic signal to noise is defined as the ratio of maximum likelihoods between a model which is fully anisotropic versus a model that's just isotropic. So between them, between these three signal to noise values, you can quantify how strong of an anisotropic detection you have in your given data set. And the scaling for the total signal to noise, again, is shown on the plot on the right-hand side. And this also goes pretty much as you would expect, where as you increase the number of pulsars or decrease the uncertainties on your cross-correlation measurements, you get a correspondingly larger value for your total signal to noise measurement. All right, so um, linking this back to the set of simulations that I introduced at the very beginning of the talk, uh, we took the same set of simulations, but this time with 100 realizations, um, and we calculated the um, cross-correlation uncertainty for all of these um, different data sets, which is shown here on the plot on the right-hand side. Um, and we can see that between the baseline of 13 years, so approximately the 12 and a half year data set and the 20 year baseline, the cross-correlation uncertainty, the median cross-correlation uncertainty at the very least, um, improves by a factor of eight. And so since we've injected just an isotropic gravitational wave background in these data sets, we want to take a look at how the different detection statistics that we've defined would evolve under this isotropic background injection. So we are essentially looking at how the null distributions evolve um, across these um, different timing baselines for the nanograph data sets. So here's how the um, signal to noise statistic evolves under this um, isotropic injection, where you would expect the anisotropic signal to noise to always stay consistent with zero. So that's shown by these orange histograms in these two plots. And so the plot on the left-hand side has a timing baseline of 13 years, and the plot on the right-hand side has a timing baseline of 20 years. And we can see that the anisotropic signal to noise always stays consistent with zero, whereas the total and the isotropic signal to noise um, move away from zero and increase in value because we have indeed injected an isotropic background. Okay. And so this sort of sets expectations for what level of, um, an for what value of the anisotropic signal to noise we would need to see in the data to actually believe that um, this is inconsistent with the null distribution for the um, signal to noise statistic. And we can do the same thing with the decision threshold. Um, and here I'm showing the evolution of this detection threshold for the um, nanograph simulations as a function of the timing baseline on this plot on the left hand side, where we have the best constraints for the lower. Uh, spherical harmonic multipoles, and these get um, progressively worse as you move to higher multipoles. Um, and the plot on the right hand side shows again the evolution of the decision threshold, but here it's plotted as a function of the um, angular multipole itself. And so what, what I particularly want you to note on, from this plot on the right hand side is that the, the points shown here in purple are the only existing limits that were placed by the EPTA um, pulsar timing analysis in the 2015 analysis. And so even with the, the 12 and a half year data set, we actually would have sufficient sensitivity to start placing better constraints than the EPTA 2015 analyses. And these would only get better as we add more data into our pulsar timing array data sets. So I'm a bit over time, so I'll, I'll leave my summary up here. Um, this is a really exciting time in, in not just pulsar time degrees, but also in nanohertz gravitation wave astronomy and astrophysics. Um, the, the, we expect to have sufficient evidence for um, an astrophysical background in the next several years. Um, so stay tuned for, for news from the PTA community. 
And um, the current PDA methods are also very well um, placed and able to place constraints on the presence of second power, of a second power law background signal in our data. And we are also able to place some of the most stringent constraints on anisotropy in the nanohertz gravitation wave background, um, even with just our current data sets. Um, thank you for thank you again for inviting us, and you have to take questions. Thank you, Nihan. Let's thank both of our speakers. Okay, we have a few minutes for questions. So do people have questions for our speakers? Please don't be shy. Uh, I have a lot of questions, way too many to get in a, in a minute or two, but so thanks for being here, guys. Uh, and I find your talk very interesting. Thank you. Um, Peter? Yeah, thanks. These were really great talks. Thanks so much. That, a really great overview and also uh, going into some depth. I did. I just picked up on one thing I wanted to ask about, which was in Steve's talk. That was um, talking about, uh, for the multi-messenger scenario, targeted PTA validation. So you're not targeting the sources in that case, I guess, but do you mean that you like re-strategize or re-prioritize um, um, observing certain pulsars with a with the goal of, of of trying to optimize sensitivity for a given target or something like that? Um, that would be a that would be a broader issue. I was just talking about using existing arrays to um, perform targeted searches on on known candidates. Um, there are about 150 or so, maybe more of these. Um, periodic quasar candidates um, for supermassive black hole binaries. And um, it's sort of impossible at the moment to say one way or the other because um, intrinsic AGN variability can appear periodic on, on, on short uh, numbers of cycles. And um, one way to resolve this issue is to do a PTA search for a single source that has fixed sky location and fixed redshift and, um, and see if the gravitational waves are detected. We might even be able to incorporate um, inclination information from, from the galaxy or other EM observations. And so that's one possibility. And what you're saying is, is really something we'd do if we had um, high suspicion that, that one of the candidates was real, um, because that would involve changing our observing um, schedule and our strategies to really direct towards one particular candidate or a few candidates. At the moment, um, it's it's not really known whether any of these are, are plausible or not, but with more baseline, we'll, uh, we'll certainly be able to resolve that with PTAs. Okay, got it, thanks. Other questions? Uh, Keith? Uh, yeah, can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Great, thanks. Yes, thank you for the excellent talks. Um, maybe this isn't something you get both directly work on, but I've heard over the years that PTAs are susceptible or theorized to be more susceptible to detecting the memory effect within gravitational waves. Um, I was wondering if either of you could speak as to kind of what the current status or thoughts are for detecting memory with PTAs. Nihan, do you want to field that or, or shall I take it? No, go for it. Um, actually, Sarah could comment on this as well. Um, the, so we, we do search for these memory events. Um, it's really the, the, the only way that we could be indirectly sensitive to the merger phase of black hole binaries uh, through memory. So we search for these, and obviously they can be roughly modeled as a step function in strength. Uh, but when you translate that to what it looks like in, in the timing deviations that we're sensitive to, um, it looks more like a ramp. And the, the sign of the ramp, whether it goes up or goes down, just depends on the antenna response of, of the Earth pulsar system. Um, one, one possible conflating noise source is um, the existence of pulsar glitches, which are changes, sudden changes in the rotational spin of the pulsar. Um, but, um, but we think through correlating information between lots of pulsars, we could be sensitive to memory events 
and um, filter out those individual pulsar glitterments. The rates are are um, a little bit low for us to be um, to be sure whether we'll get a memory event in the near future, but it's part of our kind of standard roster of searches to, on each data set. Okay, great. Thank you very much. All right. We're at the hour, so if there are no other questions, let's thank the speakers again. All right, thank you all for coming. Thanks for the invitation. Take care.